So I think we'll start with my preliminary housekeeping items as usual. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, for those of you I haven't met, my name is Verona Thibault and I manage the Saskatchewan Economic Development Alliance based in Saskatoon. Thanks again to all our members and partners who have joined us today. Today we have a really interesting panel of thought leaders that I, I think you're going to enjoy uh, to discuss different priorities and strategies uh, in business and economic recovery as we move forward. Our first presenter today uh, will be Michael Schumann. He's really, uh, most of us know, a leading guru, longtime guru in uh, local economies. Our second uh, presenter today will be Daryl uh, Gillot, Senior Business Development, Ma Development Manager with Digital Main Street, based out of Toronto. And we're going to conclude the session uh, with what I expect will be thought-provoking suggestions from our own uh, Dr. Ken Coates from the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy here at the U of S. So again, for today, please ensure that your audio is muted and your video is off uh, during the course of the webinar. If you have a question during any of the presentations, please use the chat function. And if you're having challenges with the chat, uh, just text my cell phone at 306-381-3900. The webinar will be recorded and posted on our webinar landing page uh, three working days after the event. So I'm going to uh, proceed and introduce Michael. Um, Michael was, uh, we were really pleased to have Michael actually in Saskatoon to present in uh, person at our annual conference a few years ago. He's coming to us from Washington, D.C. He's currently the Director of Local Economy Programs for the Neighborhood Associates Corporation in Washington, and he's an adjunct professor at Bard Business School in New York City. He's authored, co-authored, or edited 10 books. One of his most well-known books, uh, The Small Mart Revolution, How Local Businesses Are Beating the Global Competition, uh, has been read by many of us and received a bronze prize from the Independent Publishers Association for Best Business Book in 2006. Michael, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Verona, and a great uh, pleasure to be with you today. I've titled my talk Comparative Resilience, which is if those of you who come to my uh, blog site, michaelhshuman.com, might notice that I put out things once a week. And this one seemed to have particular resonance with audiences out there because I was trying to articulate some of the principles for a post-COVID economic development environment. Um, the conventional view about economic development is, I think, articulated by this fellow, David Ricardo, who about uh, 200 years ago basically said it's in every nation's interest to get good at one or two things, export those things, and import everything else. And I think it's fair to say that communities around the world have embraced this idea for their own basis for economic development. And while it's accomplished many things, I think the COVID era has revealed that if you are producing one thing and importing a lot of other things, you're gonna be in real trouble when it comes to crises like a pandemic. This was in the Wall Street Journal this morning, uh, conveniently enough, and it the title says, Can New York Make Another Comeback? Subtitle, U.S. Cities Thriving Before Pandemic Will Need New Economic Plans. And in my view, those new economic plans are going to need, they're going to have to be built around the values of resilience and regeneration. And the underlying principles for resilience and regeneration are really going to be quite different than what we've had under the David Ricardo form of economic development. I want to go through a couple of principles that I think you should think about as you come out of the pandemic and you think about moving your communities in the right direction. The first principle is local ownership. We know that locally owned businesses are the fundamental backbone of a healthy economy. And one of the challenges in this pandemic 
is that these businesses have been under serious threat. In the United States, we are in danger of losing literally millions of these businesses in the next few weeks. This was a study done in British Columbia in 2013, comparing the impact of a dollar spent in an independent restaurant and retailer versus a dollar spent in a chain restaurant and retailer. And what it shows is that for every dollar spent in the independent restaurant and retailer, roughly 50 cents stays in the province, whereas for the chains, it's about 18 cents on the dollar. So roughly speaking, every time a British Columbian resident mindfully spends a dollar at a locally owned restaurant and retailer, the province enjoys about two and a half times the job impact, two and a half times the income and wealth impact, two and a half times the tax consequences, two and a half times the charitable impact. We're not talking about small degrees of difference. All of this is the multiplier effect that comes because of local ownership. And there have been about two dozen of these studies done in the last 20 years, and all of them show that if you compare two businesses, one locally owned, one not, or two industries, one locally owned, one not, the locally owned business or industry generates two to four times the jobs and economic development impacts. And there is no study that has shown otherwise. This study was in the Harvard Business Review in the summer of 2010. It's a regression analysis of cities across the United States. And what it showed is that in those cities with the highest per capita uh, concentration of locally owned businesses, there is the highest per capita job growth rate. But not just that, this study from our monetary authority in Atlanta looked at counties across the United States and found that in those counties with the highest density of locally owned business, there is the highest per capita income growth rate. So in other words, if you wanna bring down poverty, if you wanna raise levels of social equity, the way to do this is by with a density and a diversity of healthy locally owned businesses. The second principle of a post-COVID economic development is to really think seriously about economic development. Now, if I was with you now live, I would ask you all a series of questions. And the last question would be, those of you with pension funds, how many of you have at least 1% of your pension funds in locally owned business. And I guarantee you that all of your hands would go down. Now, what's odd about this is that in the United States, 60 to 80% of our economy is locally owned business. In Canada, that number is a little bit higher. We have lots of data actually from Statistics Canada that smallish businesses are more profitable than largish businesses. And these data are confirmed in the United States. And yet, you Canadians systematically overinvest in the businesses on the Toronto Stock Exchange and underinvest in locally owned businesses. Uh, but frankly, you don't invest hardly anything at all in locally owned businesses. And this habit of investment is fundamentally going to have to change in the post-COVID recovery period. Fortunately, if you look across Canada, you can see lots of innovations that if you were to adopt them in Saskatchewan could really help. For example, Nova Scotia, starting in 1998, created a system of community economic development investment funds and currently has about 70 of these funds that give people incentives to invest their pension money at a community level. This woman runs one of these funds called FarmWorks, which focuses on local food and farm businesses. In Alberta and in British Columbia, they allow the use of cooperatives for investment. And if you have an opportunity, this is a wonderful little video you can find in YouTube about the Sangudo Opportunity Development Cooperative, which really saved a town through 
cooperative investment. And then if we go to New Brunswick, uh, when Brian Gallant, the young telegenic premier was leading a few years ago, he passed some tax incentives around local investment. If you live in New Brunswick, you get a 50% provincial tax credit for every dollar over $1,000 you invest in a local business. All of these kinds of policies can really push money in the right direction. And of course, part of getting things in the right direction is perhaps through self-direction. And there are ways of doing self-directed RRSPs in Canada. And my most recent book is all about how to do this in the United States. But uh, I, I give do a 30-second advertisement, which is to say this book, uh, Put Your Money Where Your Life Is, um, comes out next week. And it basically is a guide for how to find and evaluate local investments, how to think about do-it-yourself options, how to create a personal plan, and how to do community mobilization. And if anyone here is interested in constructing a deeper dive around your community, uh, I would be happy to chat with you because I do know quite a bit about Canadian securities law as well. The third principle is economic diversification. And this is the exact opposite of what uh, David Ricardo urged. Economic diversification puts a premium on being as self-reliant as you can, not to isolate yourself from the world, but to engage with the world from a position of strength. This is a study that I helped put together in, uh, that was done for the island of Mauritius off of Africa called Local is Beautiful. The main authors uh, were a think tank called Utopies. And they basically showed how this island economy could greatly increase its national uh, GDP by localizing more and more of their industry. And I found the same thing in work that I did in Greater Cleveland in 2010. Uh, this particular study called the 25% shift looked at what would be the impacts if the Greater Cleveland metropolitan area shifted its food expenditures 25% away from long distance food toward local food. And we found that this little act would create 27,000 new jobs paying about a billion dollars in new wages and generating $126 million of additional tax revenue. The bottom line is, is that contrary to David Ricardo, localization done in a smart way actually is an enormously powerful way of increasing local income, wealth, and jobs. Principle number four is sustainability. Now, you may recognize that this woman, Gro Harlem Brundtland, put out a report around sustainability uh, 30 years ago, and she argued that a good definition of sustainability is that it means meeting the needs of your people now without in any way imperiling the ability to meet the needs of future generations. That's not a bad definition, but my critique of it is it doesn't take into account place. And really, I think a smarter way to think about sustainability is every community trying to be as self-reliant as it can with the resources that it has. So I write this definition. Sustainability comes when a community meets its own needs present and future without compromising the ability of other communities to meet their needs, present and future. Principle number five is innovation. Innovation means emphasizing how you can train your citizens to be great entrepreneurs, whether in innovation hubs or maker spaces or incubators. This is one thing that really impresses me as an example. In Paraguay, they created a high school for um, 
young people who want to start local food businesses. And throughout their high school education, they each get practical experience in 16 different types of local food businesses, everything from running a restaurant to running a hotel uh, to running a, a, a dairy. And this school actually pays for itself through these micro businesses. How can we get our young people trained up for the next generation of businesses in the 21st century? I, uh, there we go. Number six, principle number six is social equity. We often think about economic development as being focused on the best and the brightest. There are certainly advantages to doing that, but I believe a smarter way of doing economic development is to make sure that no one is left behind. You know, so for example, in the United States, I've increasingly been working with the poorest communities, which are Native American communities, and helping them build financial institutions. If we pay attention to things like social equity, what we will find is that metrics like the B Corporation metrics, uh, which measure all kinds of social performance of a company, uh, are a way that we can guide our companies to become more and more of the producers of social equality. This is an example, Me Energy, of a qualified B Corporation from Saskatchewan. Number seven is connectivity. It is not enough for businesses to be great in your own community. We want businesses to connect worldwide, but the way to connect worldwide is not necessarily through dependency and weakening kinds of trade relationships. It may be through just sharing innovations. About 10 years ago, I did a study for the uh, Gates Foundation looking at community food enterprises. And the most stunning discovery was that all of these great local food businesses all over the world had international partners that they were sharing innovations with. So for example, my friend Judy Wicks, who runs a restaurant in Philadelphia called the White Dog Cafe, had a sister relationship, sister restaurant relationship with a social enterprise in Thailand called Cabbages and Condoms. And Cabbages and Condoms actually is a network of restaurants and resorts that produces money, millions of dollars a year for um, women's education around prevention of pregnancy and also around prevention of AIDS and socially transmitted diseases. Number eight is placemaking. Part of our principles for making ourselves into the 21st century is to have great places, great places for our student, for our people to come out, great places for visitors to want to come to. The state of Michigan over the last few years has had a really wonderful program where they invite every city in Michigan to come forward with a placemaking initiative. Um, and up to $50,000, whatever people donate on behalf of these placemaking place initiatives, the state will match it dollar for dollar. And they have gotten tens of millions of dollars of placemaking initiatives started this way. This is my, fellow, my friend uh, Gilbert Roche-Cous from Melbourne, who actually I think is one of the world's great placemakers. He has worked with thousands of communities worldwide. But one of the things that he did in Melbourne is help convert their alleyways, which once were sources of homelessness, uh, crime and decay, into these vibrant, walkable, uh, pedestrian ways with cafes and art. And by bringing these things alive, people have moved back into Melbourne, making it a more vibrant and economically prosperous city. Which leads me to number nine, that part of economic development must be how do we bring meaning and celebration back into our lives? We have diverse populations, diverse cultures. We should be celebrating these cultures and bringing them out as much as possible to make our communities great 
places. And finally, number 10 is democracy. Now, democracy is many things, but I think democracy is partially about accountability. And I think that every community should come up with its own set of indicators that would help to determine the direction of economic development. So uh, on the 10 ideas I just shared with you, let me give you some examples of indicators. If you wanted to measure local ownership, measure the percentage of jobs you have in locally owned business. If you want to measure local investment, look at the number of crowdfunding offerings that are succeeding in your province. If you want to measure self-reliance, look at the annual purchasing leakage in your province. If you want to measure sustainability, look at the percentage of energy consumption in the province that's coming from renewables. If you want to look at innovation, look at the number of self-defined entrepreneurs in your province. For social equity, ask how many businesses are using the B Corp survey or some other social metrics to see how they're doing in the world. If you want to measure connectivity, how many businesses like White Dog Cafe have international partners? For place, how many outdoor cafes do you have per capita? For meaning, what are the number of cultural festivals you have? For democracy, how much participation are you having in grassroots economic development planning? Where I want to end this particular talk is just to quote my favorite person in the world, which is Sir Francis Bacon. And he once said, things that have never been done, never will be done, except by means that have never yet been tried. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks so much, Michael. I, uh, I totally agree. First of all, going back to your self-reliance, it's something that we're really reinforcing here. The investing, generating your own local investment in communities is really going to be essential to save existing businesses or to fill the gap in, in services and products. Do you see, you know, in the U.S. and Canada, the, the chains as being stable? They don't seem to be from our point of view right now in terms of what we see in media. Well, I think I think there's ins massive instability in every business category right now. And even before COVID, chains and shopping malls were having a lot of difficulty. But I think, you know, what's called upon is for local businesses to reinvent themselves. Uh, I was just on the phone today with a friend of mine in North Carolina who had been producing t-shirts and now he's producing masks. And, you know, you're sometimes called by the moment to do things a little bit differently. Yeah, I agree. And I have to be honest, your, your 10 indicators is perfect. We, uh, and I'm not sure if it can recalls this, but I'm sort of on a mission to, uh, to add new uh, community indicators to the way we are, we're measuring here in Saskatchewan. So I may be borrowing that list with appropriate credit. So thanks so much. I'll invite our second presenter to come live and I'll make the introduction to Daryl while he's, getting settled here he comes so daryl again daryl Gillot is an experienced small business digital transformation and local economic development professional uh, with digital main street canada and we've been uh we've been following digital main street for over the last year and we're really interested in what they have to to bring to the rest of the country. So uh, Daryl's now focusing his expertise and vision on transformation and revitalization of digital via Main Street businesses across North America. Uh, the Digital Main Street project was created and led initially by the Toronto Association of Business Improvement Areas, and Daryl's now overseeing the execution of all programming as well as growth and expansion plans. plans. Welcome, Daryl. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? I can. We can. Yes. Okay, perfect. I'm just going to share my screen here. Michael, I might ask you to mute your video for until the end of the webinar just to save our bandwidth. Thanks so much. No problem. Uh, can you guys see my screen, Verona? Uh, yep, I'm able to. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, so first of all, thanks for having me, Verona. Thank you, everyone, for, for allowing me to kind of, you know, ramble for you for a few minutes here. Um, Digital Main Street started out as this crazy little nonprofit uh, about five years ago now. 
and we started, you know, as this hyper local initiative to just help uh, Toronto's BIA businesses with digital transformation. Um, and since then, we've uh, <clears throat> we've expanded right across Ontario. We're in about 400 cities now. Uh, we've launched uh, smaller programs in British Columbia and Alberta. Uh, we have a presence in the states as well. And then, uh, uh, as Verona mentioned, we have been having conversations uh, for the better part of about a year now, um, looking at how we can uh, engage Saskatchewan in your businesses. So I just I want to chat with you guys today quickly about two things. So the first is kind of you know, what is digital transformation and what does it mean for small business? And within that, you know, why is it so important generally, but right now, and then give you a quick kind of overview into to how digital Main Street operates to uh, to counteract that. So I, I love starting with this slide because, you know, I, I actually I hate buzzwords. So I, I hate the the digital transformation tag because you know really what does it mean? Um, so what I did is I actually I went on Google and I just typed in what is digital transformation, and so what we did is we got four consecutive definitions. These are the first four definitions that popped up. And I'm not going to read them all, but you know, if you just take a look, they're all fundamentally very different. So when you're trying to explain what this concept is, there's no black and white answer. It's it's not this or it's that. It's it's a mixture of everything. And, and that's part of the problem. And you know, when you look at this, uh, you know, you look in the first one, you know, it's the move from physical to digital. I think that's very key. When you look at the second one, they touch on the customer experience and the business processes and how they can be adjusted. I think that's very key. The reimagining of business in the digital age, um, changing how you operate and deliver value to customers. So <clears throat> I think some of those are key points. But why I always start with this is because, you know, this is what people put the definition of digital transformation out is. But at least with the businesses that we've worked with, um, this is what it looks like to them. Which is just you know uh, stuff that doesn't make sense. They don't know where to start. Um, it's it's relatively chaotic, um, you know. Or and so this was the first image on Google, by the way, for digital transformation. This was the second, which actually isn't terrible, but again isn't overly informative. Um, and then you've got this. So it's almost like they're trying to tell us this is something that's uh, super complicated, or you know, is. Is, is all of these things in one, it's 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 chaotic. But at the end of the day, it's, you know, digital transformation is just, especially from a small business lens, is just how can you become a better business and a better business owner through the use of digital tools and technologies? Um, and that's what we focus on. Um, you know, we look at very, like I said, very simply, you know, how can you use tech and, you know, digital to engage your customers? How can you use it to streamline your operations? How can you use it, um, you know, to improve your online presence? Uh, you know, all of those in one. But um, there's a lot of chaos, so we're just we're going to try and sift through the weeds a little bit. And uh, one of I love showing this clip. I'm really hoping it uh, it plays. Oh come on! Bear with me for one second. Sorry, I'm just opening it up. So, oh, I'm just gonna slide this over. Are you guys still seeing the deck, or can you see the video I just popped in? I'm just seeing the deck. Okay, I'll just have to reshare that quickly. Personally. No, that's uh, that's good. I'll reshare this now, so you can see this quick video. So this video was put together by a consultant in New York, and it's just, uh, he, he does one every year, it's called Social Nomics, and he basically looks at, um, uh, he looks at how, uh, uh, how how social media and how digital and stuff affects our everyday life. So I just, I love playing this because it, oh, it, um, it just goes into a bunch of uh, stats that really showcase how important this stuff is.
stop it there. We'll go back to the deck. Um, so I just I love that video because, like I said, it it takes some of those stats and puts them into to perspective with some of the real life items. And so what I did is I just I I highlighted a couple of these here. Oh, of course now it's going to play. Sorry. Um, so you know you look at that, and, and when we're talking about the importance of of you know having an online presence and you know just uh, being online from a small business standpoint, you look at Facebook as a social network. It's it's the largest population in the world. Um, Quite frankly, all of the social media channels, whether it's Instagram, Twitter, WhatsApp, um, you know, YouTube, like you saw the video content piece, um, they're all huge as well. So it's it's as a business now, like you you have no excuse not to be able to reach as many people as you have to. Um, and when you look at that, that really stands out. Um, you know, America, ninth in the world. Um, every social network listed is significantly higher. But then, you know, on the right, you see something around, you know, 93% of buying decisions are influenced by social. And, and that stands out to me because it's not saying that, you know, 93% of people are buying on social, you know, it's it's not saying that 93% of transactions are happening. It's, it's, you know, social media is being used truly to influence us. So those decisions are now being either directly or indirectly affected almost 100% of the time by social media. So if as a business owner, you're not on those platforms, then you're not engaging your customers, you're not reaching out to a point where you know, you can influence their buying decisions. And it's it's like like it said at the last slide, it's not a matter of if anymore, it's it's how well we're gonna do it. And then I like this one just because it's funny. Um, you know, more people own a mobile device than a toothbrush. Um, I, I actually, I asked once at a, uh, an in-person presentation I gave, I asked the audience as a joke if anyone met this criteria and someone raised their hand and it was, uh, it was a little awkward, but. Um, <laughs> No, it's, it's, you know, so when you look at your customers now, um, you know, I, I bought something on my phone literally 10 minutes before this presentation started. Um, you know, my grandparents know how to buy stuff on their phone. Uh, you know, you look at the millennials and the centennials coming up, which is the next term. Um, it's if, if you don't have a mobile friendly website, something as simple as that, like you're you're just you're so far behind the game. Um, and, and what's the impact of digital transformation? So I don't know if anyone's seen this. But this just goes back to the importance of it, too. So what this is is a screenshot from a school in the States. I forget exactly where, but it was uh, it was a high school class. And what the teacher did is for one of their periods, I think it was a 45 minute class. They had all the students put their phones in like a, a basket or a bucket or something. Couldn't touch them, turn their notifications on so you could hear them. And then at the end of it, they had they, they tallied up in a 45 minute span how many notifications the kids got. Um, keep in mind, this is in a 45 minute period for a class of probably 30. And when you look at that on a graph, you know, almost 500 text messages, you know, almost 300 Instagram messages or posts or notifications, you know, 200 almost emails, um, you know, Facebook over 100. And this is, again, 45 minutes in the middle of the day. Um, so if you're not able to touch these customers, you know, on these channels when they want to, to be reached, like, uh, again, you're starting from behind. I, I hate to say it. It's just, um, and pardon me, I'm a little... Uh, a little under the weather but uh, so I just I pulled some of my other favorite stats that have come out of some of the studies that we do and stuff you look at that um, so more transactions than ever are being influenced by digital overall um, so this is 80% of all transactions online or in store so I know that social stat of 93% that was that was specifically online but when you look at you know in some way shape or form digital technology is or, or you know digital presence is influencing our decisions 80% of the time we buy something now that could be you're looking for something online and then you're going to the store to buy it. You're looking online to do research, you're price shopping, whatever it may be. Um, and then, you know, I talked about the phone piece, but mobile consumption, it's, it's, it says here it's increasing exponentially. I don't even think that does it justice. Um, how important, you know, being able to be present on, on the mobile device for your customers is, is yeah, there, there aren't words to explain it at this point. Um, it's the easiest channel to engage your customers, to have them purchase from you, to have them engage with you. Um, and it's it just, it's it, it's incredible how fast mobile has grown and continues to grow. Uh, the nature of the online experience is changing. Um, so it's going from that experience that was never very social to doing a 180. So it's, you know, uh, 10 years ago, it was, you know, you just kind of sit in your basement, you'd click purchase and that was it. And now you're seeing sites that are, you know, engaging customers They're you know, through contesting, uh, content, whatever, you, whatever, you know, you want to call it. It's no longer just that simple linear, you know, okay, let's, let's, Get Daryl to my website. Let's have him check out. That's it. Um, there's so much more that goes into it now, 
and and that's why I think you're starting to see you know how much is going on with you know, various retailers, various service-based businesses, whatever it may be. The important thing here, though, because we are digital main street, and you know we focus on physical brick and mortar businesses, is the value of them is still present. And quite frankly, it's they're they're not going anywhere. Obviously, COVID is, has been a massive you know detriment. But when we're just talking about you know in person versus uh, online stores that actually have a physical location see a almost a 30 percent boost in their e-commerce sales um so it's not a matter of you know we always say a digital main street it's not a matter of bricks or clicks it's bricks and clicks um it's, it's not that you got to be doing one or the other and it's it's a choice you have to make it's you know at what point do you do both um so i just i wanted to kind of go over all that i know um you know we're, we're keeping things short today but i'm happy to chat verona you have my contact um, so I just very, very quickly wanted to, to talk to you about Digital Main Street. So we launched in 2016 and, uh, you know, we, I explained, well, you know, why we launched to help these businesses. And in three, oh, in three years, we've been able to engage over 20,000 businesses in Ontario. That should say through the program, my apologies. Um, this was literally the napkin when we sat one night in, a, in an office about five years ago. This was the, the drawing that conceptualized everything that is Digital Main Street now. Um, and I just I like to show that because it's just funny to see um, how far we've come and how many businesses we've been able to support. So really, we look at uh, for our program specifically, we do this in, in four key ways. I'm going to touch on the first three today. So we have, a, you know, an all inclusive web platform that has a, a benchmarking digital assessment, tons of content, events, an online training platform and more. Um, we have a digital service squad, which I'll get to in a second. Um, so that's our homepage. It's just kind of showing you a couple of the things that uh, that we have on the site, but we do have a benchmarking tool so you can log on. You can take an assessment. It's 40 questions, yes or no, and it's it's not meant to give you a score or tell you that you're doing good or bad. It's meant to just, you know, show you all the things you can potentially be thinking about for your business and how you can uh, how you can potentially implement them. Uh, so we have what we call the digital service squad, so it's a one on one support team for small business. So at any point, um, you know, I use Toronto as the example. We have uh, 12 individuals right now, and they're full-time staff, and and all they do is provide one-on-one -on -one support to businesses. Um, so they work with them virtually right now, obviously, but they help them with their website, their social media, you know, their operational stuff, you know, finding new hardware, software, all of the above. Um, and then we have what we call the Digital Main Street Academy. So every year we do about. Um, I'm going to say about oh, sorry, about 75 webinars online a year, um, and they range on topics from uh, social media to website building to you know uh, embracing digital technology for your business, um, you know really kind of that full spectrum because we want to be able to touch on all the topics. And then what you're seeing on the actual screen right now, or the screen within the screen, is our online training program. So we have a, a custom eight-hour training program that we curated entirely. Um, it's uh, it's all video based. It's on demand. And uh, it touches on every on all the key topics around website, social, all that kind of stuff. But where we really differentiate ourselves is, and you'll see the module right there, embracing digital in your business, is you know we we start and we go, okay, you know, we we need to sit down and talk about you know why digital is important for your business, talk about some of the stats, the KPIs, the benchmarks, and then look at why you know as a business owner you need to kind of start fundamentally shifting the way you think, um, and really focus on you know the concept of not just you know. It's it, digital transformation is not just, you know, buying the latest piece of hardware. It's not a brand new website. It's it really is kind of a, a seismic shift in in the way that you're running your business. And that starts obviously with, you know, the the hard the hardware, you know, the properties like your website and that, but also in in you as a business owner, you know, buying into this concept and really adopting, um, you know, this, this new way of thinking when it comes to how you're doing work and how you're engaging with your customers. Um, and then I just I put the final thank you slide there, so I'll stop uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, back to you, Verona. Thanks, Gerald. Well, one thing I wanted to point out because we've we've been in touch with uh, Digital Main Street quite often over the last few months. Um, also, uh, a sister initiative is they're working with corporate partners and uh, and funders to turn up a number of microsites for the small business. Uh, base, I think 3,000 you turned up in Southern Ontario over the last couple of weeks um, for businesses. Yeah, and we, we actually just announced today uh, more information to come, but with, with par in partnership with Google, um, we've launched our Shop Here Powered by Google program, um, which is aiming to bring 50,000 businesses across the country, coast to coast, um, e-commerce enabled by the end of the year. 
Um, well, so Verona, I, yes. yeah, I, I couldn't tell you that previously because I was under embargo, but um, uh, yeah, so more to come on that, guys, and, and Verona will share all the information with that uh, with you as soon as it's available. Okay, wonderful. Oh, I, I feel that you're, you know, you're filling an essential uh, role that we need right now in the small uh, business space, and we could certainly uh, use your support here in Saskatchewan. So I'll invite our final panelists uh, to take the mic, uh, Dr. Ken Coates. Are you still with us, Ken? Here he comes. So most of us know Ken. He's published extensively uh, on aspects of regional development in Canada, uh, although his research has taken him farther afield to Japan, New Zealand, Australia. He's currently working on a project uh, on inverting innovation, which seeks to encourage the mobilization of science and technology to address the concerns and opportunities of small town and rural Canada. He's uh, one of our great rural advocates. I'll turn it over to you, Ken. Well, great to be with you and, and so pleased to listen to those two wonderful presentations to sort of get us started. And I've sort of titled my talk about resilience in the post-COVID-19 world and sort of the view from Saskatchewan. So what does it look like? And I'm afraid that my presentation uh, is going to be a bit more gloomy than the first two, which are full of upbeat, optimistic, let's get the business going kind of ideas. Um, I think we have to sort of ground this in what the reality looks like over the next little while. And it'll be obviously very fast as we go through this. Um, the first problem we have is we don't know what the depth of the problem is. Um, we're, we're in the middle of this lockdown. We, we see everything stopping and grinding to a halt. We hear stories about unemployment rates that we don't really know. The federal government's been shoveling out money like crazy to sort of uh, you know keep everybody in, uh, outside of uh, full-on full on panic. Um, but wh where, where do we sit now? We don't really know. So the crisis was unexpected. We responded very well in an emergency circumstance. We have some real challenges. The way we've handled things on First Nations communities should worry all of us. There's been some serious uh, sort of problems, particularly in northern Saskatchewan, but other places as well. Um, we're also now seeing a weakening consensus on isolation and starting in the United States in a, in a more overt way. But Canadians, uh, we don't tend to go out and protest. What we tend to do is just sneak out and go to the park with our friends. And so we're now seeing places that were clear of the virus a couple of days ago, like New Brunswick has now had a couple of examples. We've seen that happen in Saskatoon as well. Um, all of this does is tell us is we're, we're not finished yet, that the virus is still there and will continue. We're also <clears throat> facing a massive increase in government debt. Uh, everybody's focusing on the federal government, which is spending money at a ferocious pace. We now have perhaps a trillion dollars in federal debt. Um, but the provincial government has lost massive amounts of money in terms of revenues, and the municipalities and local communities are really, really being hit. Um, and we don't even have a full accounting of that. Uh, when we no do know these numbers, which will probably not come out until the fall, uh, we're going to be shocked. Because I think personally we're going to discover that the crisis of 2020 is actually going to be the crisis of the first half of the 2020s. That this is not a six-month problem, probably even a one-year problem. It's probably a three- or a four- or a five-year problem. And, and I think that's going to take some real resolve. And in Saskatchewan, I have particular you know, things to concern ourselves about. Um, what happens after the fall of 2020? At this point, we don't really even know um, if our, how our schools will open. We don't really know what's going to happen with our colleges and polytechs and things of that sort. There's a lot of conversation about successive waves and one scientist will tell you there won't be one. Others will tell you there'll be several of them. What we're going to see is, is sort of closing and opening and reopening and reclosing as we sort of adjust. We're going to have to remain vigilant. We're going to see a partial recovery in 2020 and we're going to see a lot of discussion about the federal government and provincial governments, you know, sort of subsidy programs or stimulus packages. What do we do to get things going again? And remember that the government has essentially spent not just uh, uh, this generation's money, but a good portion of the next generation's money um, in terms of dealing with, as they had to do. No, this is not a criticism. Uh, the emergency response was essential, but it's going to take a while to dig out from that. So what are the big questions in Saskatchewan? Because they're quite different than we see in other parts of uh, other parts of the world. Um, number one is, will the oil and gas industry rebound? And I see actually two scenarios. Um, one is the federal government sort of de decides to continue to clamp down on oil and gas development. And we see this in vibrant sector, which is so important in Alberta and Saskatchewan, sort of continue to, to decline. Uh, the other one is it's very possible we will have uh, three or four major pipelines developed in the next 12 to 18 months. 
Um, we're actually seeing Trans Mountain work going ahead. Coastal Gas Link is going ahead with natural gas. Line 3 construction is underway. Um, even the, uh, the, the TMX going down south is working as well. Um, so we've got these pipeline projects that could actually see a rebirth of the oil and gas industry as demand rebounds later on in 2020 when the planes start to fly, people get back in their cars and things of that sort, particularly in, in Asia and, and South Asia. Um, so there's a chance the oil and gas industry will rebound. Um, we got a real problem with agriculture. Uh, agriculture is not a sector of the economy that's well understood in Ottawa. Um, it's not seen as being so essential to the country as a whole as it used to be. Um, I love the presentations Michael was talking about sort of growing local. Of course, in Saskatchewan, we're, we're, we're growing lentils for South Asia um, and we're growing wheat for the whole rest of the world. So, so our challenges are very, very different. Um, it's not an industry that's well understood in Ottawa, and I think the response has been slow. Um, but I think if the global recovery comes along as we thought, uh, it could be uh, really quite, quite dramatic in 2020. If you found the area that I'm most concerned, a couple of areas that I'll flag for you. There's, uh, number one is small business. Michael talked about this and Daryl as well. Um, this is a huge Canadian dilemma. We don't talk enough about small business, the backbone of the Canadian economy. Um, I hear numbers uh, between 20 and 50 percent of small businesses in Canada uh, are at risk of uh, going bankrupt and closing. Um, I think 20 percent is too low. I think we're probably already at almost 20 percent. Um, they haven't closed and announced their closure yet. They're already sort of walking away from their leases. 50% uh, is possible, and that would be of catastrophic, catastrophic significance. I mean, it's staggeringly important. Um, we have some support mechanisms, but it's, it's slow. Um, this is an interesting situation because it actually, on the one hand, creates a massive opening for entrepreneurs and investors. As these stores close down and, and shops open up, there's going to be landlords looking for new, new businesses. They're going to be offering discounts and rates. Um, this is a great opportunity for entrepreneurs to sort of shake things up, to come up with new business ideas in new locations. Uh, that we'll see how that works out. Um, we're, but we're also seeing an enormous amount of turmoil with employees. I'm sure every single one of us knows not just one or two, but dozens of people who are eagerly waiting to find out if the gym is going to reopen, if the restaurant's going to reopen, et cetera, et cetera. And as we start to see the regulations that go along with reopening, um, I know owners of a, of a gym here in Saskatoon have decided not to reopen right now and may not for a couple of months because the requirements are, are too severe. And many restaurants will not be able to open profitably based on the new regulations. So this is not, it's going to be a slow process and small business is taking it on the chin in a major way. And we need the country as a whole to understand and appreciate that. We're also going to see a cautious return to work. I'm really interested in, in how, you know, 25% of people sort of want to get out there and go watch a baseball game tomorrow and they want to go back to work in a regular way. But probably 50 to 40 to 50 percent of Canadians are really nervous about going back to work. They're scared about catching the virus, spreading the virus and being part of that continuing sort of a, a, a virus a, a pandemic. Um, but they're going to have to step away from government support. So the money will run out. It might run out in the fall. It might run out to midsummer. We're not going to have as much money to sort of distribute in the same sort of way. We're going to see people going back to work, but I think very, very cautiously. Um, I'm very troubled by what's happening in rural and small town Canada, and everybody in Saskatchewan will know that this is sort of our bread and butter and the heart and soul of this of this great province. Um, they're, they're not being well recognized, I think, in the process now. To put this in a sort of a negative way, it's kind of positive if you're in a big city, is we're in the middle of a rapid growth of a city-state economy that the five or six major places in the country, the five or six largest cities are going to continue to grow. Vancouver, Toronto will be fine. Ottawa will be fine. Montreal will recover. Um, Calgary, we'll see about that. But the rest of the country is actually very much at risk. And this is particularly true in rural and small town Canada. Um, the research shows that things like the carbon tax have a disproportionate impact on, on rural communities and small towns and in agricultural areas than they do on the urban environment. Um, and and it's, it's, this is something we're not sort of recognizing yet. We need a small town revitalization strategy in Canada. And that's not talking about more government support necessarily. It's about the private sector. It's about local business, chambers of commerce, municipal and federal governments. We need to sort of think about rebuilding the, the economic vitality of small towns in Canada in a major way. And if I use the one example of this, 
Uh, the one that actually just traumatizes me because I have lots of friends in the sector. The tourism industry in this country is being ravaged in, a, in a, an unbelievable way. Um, we just the closing of airlines, the canceling of cruise ship operations. I, I, some of you will know I'm from the Yukon, and they've canceled the entire fall, summer and fall cruise ship season going up to Skagway, which brings thousands and tens of thousands of wealthy um, tourists into the Yukon every year. So there's hotels that aren't closing, jobs that aren't being filled, restaurants that are closing down, and on and on. We're going to see that. We've seen uh, fishing resorts close in the north. Uh, hunting resorts will close as well. Um, we will see a rebound in, in local tourism. So for places like uh, Cypress Hills in the, in the southwest corner of Saskatchewan, uh, Waska Sioux, we'll probably actually see a, a boost in uh, tourism if we're allowed to go back in the tourism industry in July and August and into, into September. But we're going to see a sharp decline in international tourism. Uh, we rely very heavily on American tourists coming up for the hunting and fishing and bird watching and things of that sort. Um, and like the whole whole small business sector, this is putting a major thousands, hundreds of thousands of Canadian companies very, very much at risk. So, so what are the recovery strategies for long-term resilience? So, so let me start by saying this. It is going to be extremely difficult. Uh, we have not been talking enough about this in Canada. That's why I was delighted when Verona invited me to participate today. By all means, we had to focus in the short term on the on the virus and on the pandemic. I think we did a good job as Canadians. We've been conscientious and reliable. We need to have a conversation now that focuses just as intensely on the recovery. And we need to be very careful and cautious and deliberate about this. It will not be easy. It will be very difficult. We're going to lose some of our favorite restaurants and favorite stores and favorite small businesses. Um, you're going to see people moving more of their money into, into larger towns, the Saskatoons and Regina's of Currents and things like that, Prince Albert's, but taking them away from the smaller communities. And that's something we have to be very, very nervous about. So, so what are our recovery strategies? Well, first off, we need intense entrepreneurship. Uh, we need to take entrepreneurship far more seriously in this country. We need to support it in ways that we have not supported it before. Um, sometimes this is about taxes, and I think we're going to have to talk about that very seriously, particularly for small businesses, uh, tax holidays for people getting started in the business area. We need to strip away the problems with paperwork and approvals. Uh, we have become too much of an application-based country in this in, in Canada. Uh, the costs of starting a business are too, too high. But we need to un unleash our entrepreneurial spirit. It's there in Saskatchewan. It's there in Canada. It's not as strong as it needs to be. And, and we put a whole bunch of barriers and constraints around it. So if we're going to recover. We better become much more entrepreneurial uh, than we are at present. And I see this in part. We're so used to Canada of comparing ourselves, as Michael very, very carefully uh, told us, about situations in the United States where entrepreneurship is, is, is a bit much stronger part of their culture than it is in Canada. But so it is in many other countries. Um, I've spent a lot of time in Scandinavia, a lot of time in, in East Asia. And I'll tell you, their entrepreneurial spirit in those regions is much more intense than it is in Canada. Um, and we better we better unleash this. We better sort of find a new way. This is like a post-war recovery. We need to take it that way. Um, we have to sort of look for what I describe as shared competitiveness. And this is about, about localization. It's about actually not dealing just as, a, as one company at a time, but dealing with it as, as a community, uh, looking for collective app, app opportunities, collective responses. You know, it isn't, <laughs> Dare wasn't talking about a digital store. He was talking about a digital main street of actually getting the whole place together and combined and looking for partnerships. Um, here's an area that I think we're very weak on, um, and it's, it's an area it's about global awareness. Um, we have, we've now discovered China. We now will know where Wuhan is. And we certainly know a lot more about different parts of the world as we watch the virus sort of spread around. But I'll tell you, Canada is not good on its international and global engagement. We know way too little about what's going on in China, way too little about East Asia. And I mean this in a positive way. Uh, we should be absolutely astonished by what Taiwan has done, not just with the virus where they've been unbelievably strong, but also in their economic development and recovery. Uh, go back to the 1960s, Taiwan was a very poor agricultural uh, country. Um, now it's actually a vibrant high-tech country, and they've done extremely well. We don't even realize where we fall behind, and I think this applies very, very much on the technology side. We need to know what the rest of the world is doing. And some of you may have heard me talk before about the fact that we should be paying attention to the uh, uh, to the Israels of the world, to the Singapores of the world. I spent some time last fall in, in northern Sweden, an area that's like going into northern Saskatchewan. 
and the vibrancy and the and the and the quality of life in those areas are demonstrably dramatically higher than they are in northern Saskatchewan. We we are no longer sort of really belong in the top ten countries in the world, uh, and we're sliding down those scales. And I think we need to be honest about that. Our major cities are among the best cities on the planet. We have. Five of the top 20 cities in the world are Canadian cities. We do urban very well. We do not do small town and rural areas very well at all. So as a consequence, we're actually not well placed for resilience and renewal. Other countries will actually come out of this pandemic stronger than we are. Um, our response in Canada has been government intense. We've waited for our prime minister every day to tell us which group was getting more subsidies and more support, and we needed that very desperately. But we have not seen a sort of a collective community-based response yet at all. So my observation is to wrap up is to say that that the reaction to COVID-19, uh, particularly if it persists for a year, if it, if it ends in July and everything's back to normal, I don't think we will, but if it ended then we, we'd recover relatively quickly. If it persists into 2021, which is possible, um, we're going to be looking at something that makes the recovery in 1945 look like fairly straightforward. After World War II, remember the two things that brought us out of our, our wartime crisis and, and, and problem. Number one was a massive resource boom. We opened up northern Canada, northern Saskatchewan in a major way, and that created an enormous amount of prosperity. And the second one was we discovered consumer demand, and we had a huge consumer-driven uh, economic re rebirth in the 1950s. Um, we don't, we're not going to have that uh, this time around. We, there was no resource boom looming. In fact, we have to hope we don't kill off the resource economy that we have right now. Um, but there is no consumer boom coming either. Canada is heavily indebted, both personal debt and municipal, federal, provincial debt. We owe an awful lot of money to an awful lot of people. There is not a lot of consumer capital out there that's going to flood back in and rebuild our economy. So we have to be very deliberate. So when I look at what's going on, two, two things stand out, and I'll finish with this. We need to approach the COVID-19 recovery as a local, provincial, and national challenge. Uh, it is every bit as important as the pandemic response itself. We responded well to the pandemic. Let's see if we can respond well to the recovery afterwards, but it will take a great deal. What I find when I look around the world and talk to my friends in different countries is we have countries and regions where the people care about each other very strongly. This is implicit in both Michael and Derek's presentations. And um, these are places where people really care and really dig in. When I look at the places that really care, and I, I draw your attention to Taiwan, give you a lot of give a lot of kudos to Finland. Um, spend a lot of time in the last few years in Norway, and they are doing really well. They are as soon as the pandemic hit, they started planning for the end of the pandemic. Um, they're doing really well. Um, we're going to see leapfrogging happen. We're going to see some countries surge to the front. Other countries are going to fall further behind. Right now, it's not clear where Canada will go. You all know that I hope very much that it will be small town, rural, and Western Canada that will lead in a lot of this revitalization and expansion. Um, I'm not confident that it will, um, but I think the people uh, that all you represent as community development officers and local uh, politicians and local, local community leaders, you're the ones that are going to determine how far we go and how well we do. Thank you very much. Well, Ken, that was a sobering uh, point of view. I can't, um, I can't argue with, with, uh, with what you've shared, especially your closing comments. I do have a question from one of our um, attendees, James Lear. He uh, he says that you mentioned September. Do you think we will see a build out of the shoulder season in tourism? Is that an opportunity? I do think it's an opportunity for local tourism. If we look at September in a sort of an interesting way, um, and and sort of uh, and start working on it right now, we I, here, here's my observation, James. It wasn't what you expected to hear. I think Canada asks less of its citizens than any other country in the world. Norwegians ask an awful lot of their of their citizens. I mean, Taiwan and Japan ask an enormous amount. In Canada, we think the country exists for us rather than the other way around. So here's my challenge back to you. Um, I think we could make actually uh, the tourism industry in Saskatchewan a sign of provincial robustness and determination. I think we should basically ask Saskatchewan people to say, whatever you're doing this summer, save some money to stay local, to experience things within the province and maybe even link a little bit into Alberta and Manitoba 
Manitoba, but let's let's make it for here in, in, in Saskatchewan as a whole. We could actually demonstrate to the whole country that we care so deeply in the province. We're going to spend our, our money in, in this province. We're going to use it in the way Michael described, invest it locally, rebuild these tourism sector, which is devastated by what's happened so far. Most places, hotels have lost almost all their reservations. Yes, we can do it. Um, but the interesting thing is, you know, we're not you're not used to that. We're not used to telling people in Saskatchewan how they should behave. But let's do it this time and let's get together collectively on a regional basis, on a provincial basis. Let's tell people to stay home, spend their money in Saskatchewan, rebuild these these activities and discover one of the most beautiful places on the planet. Well, I agree. Um, any closing comments from Michael or Daryl? Would you like to weigh in on uh, what Ken has uh, discussed with us today? I hear none. Thank you. Thanks so much to to all three of you for joining us. I'm I'm definitely once this uh, webinar gets online early next week, I'm going to be pushing this out uh, along with a call to action. Very valuable information. Uh, perspective and uh, potential strategies for us to uh, embrace at a community level. Uh, in closing, a reminder of our webinar next week. We have three more in the series. Uh, next week, our special guest will be Don Mackey uh, from Nebraska with E2 Entrepreneurship Ecosystems, and he'll be talking about the importance, and it relates to what our presenters have shared today, the importance of creating strong local and regional entrepreneurship systems. So stay well, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Bye for now.